are back with another round of Turing mock interview series. I am Love, a full stack developer at Turing. I am from Surat, India, and I have experience in working with React Node, JavaScript, React Native, among other tech, tech stacks. Today, I'll be interviewing Xinxiang for the role of an experienced machine learning engineer. So let's uh, hear from Xinxiang. How are you doing, Xinxiang? Uh, uh, how was your day so far? Yeah, I'm fine. My day is fine as well. Okay, that's great to hear. So let's begin with our first question. Uh, can you tell us more about yourself and your professional experience? Okay, sure. So I'm a machine learning scientist in theory, and I'm mainly working on ranking algorithms to rank software engineers based on their capabilities with respect to a job. So I'm currently leading a team with six direct reports. And uh, actually, I participated in uh, various co Kegel competitions. I'm a Kegel competition master with three gold medals. Also, I have a PhD in computer science. So that's a brief introduction of mine. <laughs> that's pretty great. Uh, uh, having a Kegel competition master in team is just amazing. So I can see like how uh, you have been working with machine learning. So can you tell us more about uh, the machine learning projects you have worked on in past? Okay, sure. Uh, as mentioned earlier, I mainly work on the ranking algorithms in tiering. And so I may want to start from uh, what is tiering's mission. So tiering's mission is to match uh, software engineers to remote jobs. We have a platform with various developers' information, I mean software developers' information. And to serve a job, we need to rank these uh, software developers based on their capabilities or relevance. And my team and I mainly work on maintaining and improving this ranking algorithm. Uh, we frame this problem as a binary classification problem. So given a job and a developer, we try to predict whether this developer will be hired by the job or not. Uh, so this model is trained using historical data. Each row of the data is a pair of job and developer. And the target is whether the job will hire the developer. So this is a binary classification problem. The positive examples will be the one who are hired and the negative examples will be the one who are not hired. And the features we use includes um, the job requirements, and the features about the developer capabilities and some interactive features. For example, uh, the developer score in a technical test about the required skill of the job. So these kind of interactive features directly involve the interaction between the uh, developer capabilities and also the job requirements. Yeah, this okay. is the most that, major project in theory. Yeah, that makes sense. Like. Uh matching a good developer with a, a perfect job match that's a, a really hard job because like some people might have skills but they might be looking for some extra benefits and in other way like some people are not looking for benefits but they might be lacking in skills so like you need to match both to make sure that you have a perfect match for that particular job so yeah, let's right. move uh, and like, as you mentioned, a binary classification problem, I understand that there, uh, there are more uh, different kind of problems and algorithms which you decide to use based upon the given problem. So can you tell us how do you make sure which machine learning algorithm to use for a given problem? Um, so, okay, I will start from this particular problem. So we frame it as a binary classification problem. Uh, actually, initially, we start with a logistic regression model. So we pick this simple algorithm. Uh, for, for information, logistic regression model is a linear model. So we just fit a linear function for this, uh, for this task, basically. So we pick this simple algorithm mainly due to its full interpretability. Uh, so in our case, because initially, the positive examples, which means the higher developers are always limited. So we do not have big data. We do not have a lot of data. The model can easily overfit and learn something unexpected. For example, the model may learn something like, uh, the higher the developer's salary, the more likely he will be hired. And obviously this is uh, not intuitive. This is counterintuitive. And if the model learns something like this, it basically means that 
um, we do not have enough features to capture the capabilities of the developers. Because given that uh, if we have enough features to capture the capabilities, then with the same level of capabilities, um, the, the, it cannot be the, the higher the price, the better the, the, the developer. But uh, <laughs> the, the reality should be, uh, should be inverse. So uh, it should be with the same level of capability, the cheaper the price, the more likely the developer is, uh, 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 it's, is to be hired. Yeah, so using simple algorithm like logistic regression, we can easily debug our model based on the model coefficients. So as I mentioned, we will learn a linear function, right? So each feature will have a coefficient and we can see whether the coefficient makes sense or not. So let's say for the salary features, it should have a negative coefficient, but not a positive coefficient. Yeah, if we found a positive coefficient, then we need to adjust something. Maybe the data preparation or maybe adding more features. Yeah, certainly um, after having more and more training data, we can also use some uh, more complex model. For example, the gradient boosting trees. Um, we use a model called like GBM as well after getting more and more training data. And this kind of model can capture non-linearity, not like the logistic regression, only fit a linear line. Uh, but um, this model, uh, since it is more complex, it is harder to debug. So we only switched to this after we had more training data and we have gained enough insights to the data such that we are confident uh, that the model will not overfit and learn something unexpected. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's the main point. If model is learning that which is unexpected, you need to either change your model or need to train more data so that your model can be reframed and it uh, correctly predicts whatever the data you are looking for. Okay, so as we yeah. discussed about the models, uh, can you tell us about uh, precision and recall in a particular model? Uh, sure, precision is out of all the data points that the model predicted as true, relevant, or positive, how many of them are actually true, relevant, and positive? Yeah, and recall is out of all the data points that are actually true, relevant, or positive, how many of them are detected or classified as uh, true, relevant, or positive by the machine learning model? Okay, so. I think uh, in simple words, precision is something that whatever the prediction has been made from that, how many data are predicted correctly. And for recall, it is uh, how from whatever data that has been predicted, uh, it is how many data are correct. Like uh, it's returning positive results. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So now moving forward to next question. As you mentioned that uh, model can overfit. I also assume that models can be underfitting if there are less features so that like a model cannot learn a particular uh, fe a particular feature for that particular data set. So how do you tackle overfitting and underfitting? Okay, uh, perhaps I will answer this question from uh, uh, starting from the, the definition of overfitting and underfitting. Yeah. Uh, overfitting means the model fitted the training data very well, but this fitness is not generalizable to unseen instances. So basically it fitted the training data too well. It's uh, generated some very complex pattern from the training data, but the complex pattern is not going to work for other instances, other unseen instances. I mean, un when I say unseen, I mean unseen by the model. Yeah. Uh, and to detect this overfitting, we can compare the training loss and the validation loss, or maybe not loss, uh, but, uh, but some scores like the accuracy scores and the F1 scores and so on, any metrics. So if the training loss is very low, but the validation loss is much greater than the training loss, this is an indicator of overfitting. Um, we can fix this problem by using a simpler algorithm. Uh, for example, if you use a logistic re regression model, instead of a, a gradient boosting trees model, then the logistic regression model will have a much lesser prone to overfitting, to overfit, yeah. And um, another way is we can add more constraint to the model, for example, regularization. Um, we can use L1 regularization, we can use L2 regularization, 
And for neural network, we can even use drop out regularization. So all this regularization is generating constraint to the model to let the model less flexible. In this case, the model has less prone to overfit. And also for underfitting, uh, underfitting is uh, underfitting means when the model doesn't fit the training data well enough. So of course, it failed to capture the pattern in the data. And in this case, uh, for the for the unseen data, it is not going to uh, it is not going to work well as well because even the training data it cannot fit well. So yeah. in this case, we may need a more complex or flexible model instead. Um, for example, if originally we are using a linear regression model, perhaps using a more complex neural network or using a more complex uh, gradient boosting tree will work. Yeah, this is how okay. we can tackle overfitting and underfitting. Yeah, so overfitting in general terms, you are using a simple model for your complex data. So you might need to switch to a complex model so that your data can fit well. And for underfitting, you might be using a really complex model for a generalized data, which doesn't require that much complex model. And you should be switching to a one level back where your model can learn data well and it can fit data particularly fine so that it can predict whatever you are looking for. Okay, uh, so I heard you mentioned loss and cost. So I remember there are loss functions and cost functions to calculate uh, those uh, details for each model. So can you tell us the key difference between them, uh, like difference between a loss function and a cost function? Um, I actually believe the two terms is not that different. Uh, so uh, the two terms can actually be used in the changeability. Uh, both loss function and cost functions are equations to calculate the division uh, between the predicted value and the actual value, the ground truth. So to be precise, perhaps loss function is used when only a single data point is considered. Uh, but cost function is the aggregate version that capture the, the sum or the mean of the losses over the entire training set. Okay, that makes sense. So let me take the next question. Uh, so there are outlier values for each model. How do you handle those outlier values in a particular model? Um, so of course, the first thing is uh, we need to determine whether we really need to tackle this or not. So uh, for some models, like tree-based model especially, uh, for example, random forest and the uh, gradient boosting trees that I mentioned before. Uh, these three base models are actually robust to outliers because uh, they are uh, they fit the model, they fit the data set based on splitting, and they will just fit the outliers to another branch. So it handles the outlier automatically. So for uh, when we are using this kind of models, then perhaps we don't need to do any handling. Uh, to outliers values. Uh, but if we are using models like linear regression, then possibly uh, we need to handle outliers carefully because it can uh, affect the model significantly. And uh, maybe the, uh, the fitted term is not generalizable uh, in the case that we have outliers in our data. So to detect these outliers, maybe we can visualize our data set using uh, box plot and scatter plot. So we can see whether there are points that um, is very different from uh, others or not. Uh, if they are, then we can handle them by uh, maybe simply dropping them. And also we can use some transformation as well, for example, log transformation. So after doing a log transformation, the feature is in log scale and the influence of outliers will be uh, reduced very much. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that way, like we can reduce the outlier values. So my next question for you is, uh, what is clustering? Um, okay, clustering. So um, we in machine learning, we have supervised learning and unsupervised learning. Supervised learning means we have a labels to learn from. Uh, we have the target variable and the target variable is usually known in the training data. But uh, for unsupervised learning, that means we do not have a target. And clustering actually belongs to the latter, 
So unsupervised learning. So clustering is a process of grouping a set of objects into groups or cluster. So the objects in the same cluster should be similar to one another, while the objects in the different cluster should be dissimilar to one another. So there are a few popular clustering algorithms. Um, the most classic one will be k-means clustering. In k-means clustering, we initially um, random assign k centrics, and then um, we assign each element in the data, each data points uh, to the nearest centroid. So um, based on this centroid, we, we actually separate the data points into k clusters. And we keep repeating this process. I mean, OK, after assigning the element to the nearest uh, centroid, we recompute the centroid of each cluster. So after that, we keep repeating this process. So uh, we do another round of um, cluster assignment, and we do another round of centroid uh, recalculation. After a few rounds, then the cluster assignment will converge. And now the K cluster will have lower intra-cluster distance and higher inter-cluster distance, which is the aim of the clustering. So this is an example of a clustering algorithm. I guess I can stop here. Yeah, yeah. That pretty much covers a uh, detailed overview of a uh, clustering and k-means clustering, how a cluster should be formed. So moving forward to the next question, can you explain correlation and covariance? Okay, I will start from covariance. Uh, covariance measure the tendency of two uh, random variables to go up or down together relative to their means, uh, or we can say expected values. So expected values is equivalent to the mean. And uh, however, uh, covariance is scale dependent. So let's say uh, the covariance will be much larger if we measure our variables using meters instead of kilometers. So to make covariance comparable across different units, uh, there is a normalized version of it, uh, which is called correlation. So correlation is simply the covariance divided by the standard deviation of the both variables. After this division, uh, the scale and unit um, become standardized. So one unit is one standard deviation, basically. So uh, the measure becomes skill and unit independent, and it's always within negative one to one. So of course, both uh, correlation and covariance measure the tendency of two random variables to go up or down together. But covariance is not normalized, but correlation is normalized. Yeah, yeah, yeah that makes sense. Can you tell us about ensemble learning? OK, ensemble learning is a method that combines multiple machine learning models to create a more robust model. So there are a few common ways of doing so. We can combine the models training from slightly different training set. This technique is called bagging. So for bagging, um, we apply bootstrap sampling uh, to create multiple training sets. And a model is trained using each of these training sets. Then the model predictions are averaged in the end. So um, basically, the model training from this slightly different training set are average. OK. And then so bagging mainly reduce the variance of the model. So um, of course, because the model error is, uh, so the model errors uh, is comprising of uh, variance bias and the irreducible error. So bagging mainly reduce the variance and indirectly it can improve the model performance of course. And uh, another method is called boosting. So for boosting, we always train the next model uh, to emphasize on the data points where the previous model was wrong. So we, uh, for example, we can fit the model on the residual of the previous model. So then the new model is combined with the previous model uh, with a small learning rate. The model is improving uh, incrementally in this way. So uh, boosting reduce bias uh, of the models. And of course, we can also simply combine the predictions of different algorithms. For example, we can combine a neural network model with a gradient boosted tree model. 
um, generally ensemble learning from diverse models result in better balance between bias and variance, hence leading to better model performance. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think it sums up all the questions we had. But I have one more question for you. As you mentioned that you are a Kegel competition master, how do you think like taking part in a particular Kegel competition could help you in solving real world machine learning algorithm problems? Um, okay, this is a good question. Um, I guess um, there are a group of people thinking that uh, Kegel competitions are just optimizing the last uh, 0 0.1 percent accuracy by tweaking the model hyperparameters, uh, testing different models, ensemble, uh, and so on. But I'm quite against this opinion actually. I do admit that some competitions are really like that. So uh, we basically the competitions only involve some very classic problems, and the participants uh, just need to uh, try different models, tune the hyperparameters to optimize the score, and possibly the scores different between the top solutions is not that far off because the problems is already well explored. Um, there is not much space to improve. Yeah, however, um, there are also certain competitions that are more open-ended and which we can frame the problem in different ways. Uh, taking, in, taking part in such competition is really good. Uh, it's really a good way to practice machine learning design. So I remember in the competition, we were given some football videos. And in the videos, the football players were wearing helmets. And then the task of the competition is to detect helmet impact. So by helmet impact, I mean, um, we want to detect the moment when the helmet uh, colliding one another. So the helmet collide, when the helmet colliding, it means the helmet have an impact to protect the head. So this is helmet impact. And obviously this is an object detection task because we are given uh, some videos and we want to detect the helmets and the, collide, the, the collision moment basically. Uh, however, there are different ways to tackle this problem. Um, first, the most obvious way is to use a object detector and the object detector will have a classifier head. So the classifier head can detect whether there is a collision or not at the moment. So um, in this way, we train the model from end to end, but we can also use a two-stage approach instead. So we use an object detector to detect the helmets, and then we crop each of the helmet and the surrounding out. And using the, uh, using the crop, we can de determine whether a collision happened or not. Yeah, uh, actually using this two-stage way uh, is, is somehow better because uh, it saves some computational resources. Since to determine a collision, we probably don't need to backpropagate through the whole uh, image frame, but instead we only need to focus on the, the surrounding of the helmet. Yeah, uh, so I have already mentioned two ways, but the way my team use is a very special way. Um, we know that collision happen uh, with a pair of helmets, of course, because without a pay, we can't collect uh, with each other. And um, making use of this fact, we, we form a special solution. We have a helmet detector and also a helmet tracker. So helmet by helmet tracker, I mean, uh, a video is a series of frames. So the purpose of the helmet tracker is to keep track of the same helmet over different frames. Of course, we only use a very simple algorithm for this one. And uh, basically, for this, even for this stage alone, uh, our model has some errors. But it doesn't stop us uh, getting good score in the end using this framework. So um, we form a helmet pair data set after that. And then um, given the location, velocities, or acceleration of two helmets in the past few frames, because we can identify the same frame, uh, the same helmet in different frames, so we can get the location velocities and acceleration of the past few frames. And then we determine, uh, we predict whether uh, this pair of helmet, this particular pair of helmet will collect each other in the current frame with these features or information. So we actually frame this uh, data set into a tabular data set. And this yeah. is totally out of the box because this is a video 
analytics competition. But in the end, we form a tabular data set and do a tabular data set modeling. So um, this is simply a tabular binary classification problem. Yeah, of course, we can also add some uh, visual features, uh, like we can add the uh, helmets crops as feature as well. Um, using a CNN, we can uh, we can extract features from these images and then uh, combine to our model as well. However, we do not have time in the end to try this. So we only base on the tabular method and we get 12 place. And this is actually pretty good. So yeah. what I wanted to say is, yeah. Uh, yeah, what I wanted to say, amazing. yeah, go ahead. That's really amazing. And uh, I would recommend you to share more like Kegel experience uh, from your end. So that like, as you are already a three-time champion, uh, I would say like three time uh, Kegel competition winner. Uh, that must be something uh, in its achievement list. So I would recommend you to share some thoughts on that so that like uh, everyone can learn from that experience and they can understand like how Kegel competitions are framed. Okay, sure. Um, so to be precise, actually, uh, I, I have three gold medals from three different competitions, but gold medals doesn't mean champion. And yeah. it doesn't mean the first place. It just means maybe the top 10 or the top 12 or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Like um, in a leaderboard. So, sorry? Like in a leaderboard. Top like position. Leaderboard. Leaderboard. Yeah. So uh, what I wanted to say is, uh, for, from the given example uh, just now, is um, by choosing the right competition, a competition can be much more interesting than what uh, most people imagine, perhaps. It is not just tweaking the hyperparameters, just testing different models. And we can always learn to frame different real world problems in different ways, uh, such that um, it is, we can effectively solve the problem with our machine learning skills. And these techniques uh, to frame different real world problems into machine learning problems are exactly what we need when solving real world problems. So yeah, I believe Kegel actually helps a lot is a great learning platform. Yes, yes. That's a lot of information covered. And I think you mentioned a pretty much good details regarding Kegel competitions that will help people a lot. So with this, I wrap this video. Thank you, Xinjiang. For, it was really nice speaking with you. To everyone else, thank you for tuning in to this mock interview series. And I hope you really enjoyed this video as much as I did. We will be back with many more episodes covering different text stacks and languages. If you are looking for a particular text stack videos, please drop in your suggestions in comment section below and don't forget to give us a like. If you are uh, looking for more videos, please make sure to subscribe to our channel. Take care, stay safe and happy coding.